And uh, now to uh, Macdonald Laurier Institute and uh, Mr. Philip Cross, please. Thank you. A consensus is emerging that Canada's weak economic growth and low productivity constitute a national crisis. It is hard to avoid that conclusion when real GDP growth in the last decade has been the slowest since the 1930s. As, the population, as population growth surged, real GDP per capita slumped to levels last seen in 2014. Bank of Canada Governor, Deputy Governor Caroline Rogers recently called Canada's lagging productivity, quote, an emergency. It's time to break the glass. Concern about our flagging growth is not new. A Senate committee warned in 2018 Canada is falling behind. Former Cabinet Ministers Lisa Raitt and Anne McClellan in 2023 formed the Bipartisan Coalition for a Better Future to lobby for stronger economic growth. Based on current trends, the OECD predicts Canada's growth over the next quarter century will be the slowest in the region. While faltering growth is widely lamented, the diagnosis of its causes often is off pace. The interaction of three variables determines growth, the supply of labour, the stock of capital and the efficiency with which they are combined what is called total or multi-factor productivity. Canada has relied too much on raising labour inputs. Raising labour inputs in the absence of more investment in productivity likely contributed to lower GDP per capita. Business investment has fallen 21% since 2014, inevitably lowering productivity. Rogers pinpointed weak investment as the main source of Canada's poor productivity. The U.S. demonstrates high investment and productivity are achievable in a society that rewards risk-taking and encourages disruptive innovations. U.S. business investment surged 33 percent since 2014, the same period over which it fell 21 percent in Canada. Optimism about the potential productivity benefits of artificial intelligence has sent the U.S. stock market soaring, soaring on increased confidence that fair, higher productivity can simultaneously boost growth while slowing inflation. Lagging growth in Canada is a national crisis. As our incomes fall behind the U.S., the temptation increases for our most productive and ambitious people to emigrate. The late Michael Bliss, Canada's leading historian of business, warned, quote, the one sure prescription for the eventual failure of the Canadian experiment in nationality would be to create an ever-widening gap in standards of living between the two North American democracies. Avoiding this outcome should be our national priority. One solution is to encourage, not restrain, the development of our natural resource sector, which is by far Canada's leader in investment and productivity. Distracting on a focus on growth is the controversy surrounding the recent hike to the carbon tax, which provoked its advocates to mount a last gasp defence. 300 supporters signed a petition back in the tax, buttressed by numerous op-eds and media appearances. However, rather than being persuasive, advocates mostly demonstrated how little they have learned from their long-standing failure to sell the tax to Canadians. Proponents like to say the tax is the most efficient way of reducing carbon emissions while limiting the economic losses. This ignores that technological change is even better at lowering emissions while boosting economic growth, as the U.S. has demonstrated. The credibility of carbon tax advocates was damaged when advocates claimed BC's small 2008 carbon tax triggered a sharp reduction in gasoline sales. Supporters saw this drop as evidence emissions could be slashed with a small carbon tax, an exercise of hope triumphing over experience that economists are supposed to be immune to. Today, proponents acknowledge a carbon tax needs to be painful to meaning, meaningfully lower consumption. However, the demonstrated willingness of supporters to assert the tax had magical properties severely undermined their credibility and reputation for impartiality. I'm going to skip a couple of paragraphs here to save on time and just go to the last two paragraphs. Proponents quote the Bank of Canada's calculation that the annual carbon tax increases increases of $15 a tonne contribute 0.15 percentage points to inflation. This sounds trivial when inflation is run, running at 8 percent, but represents a sizable 7.5 percent of the bank's 2 percent target. Moreover, the bank said its estimate does not include second-round effects. 
Arguing that carbon tax impacts is trivial is risky for advocates since its impact and behavior would also be limited, making the tax more an exercise in virtue signaling than a serious attempt at lowering emissions. Christopher Reagan, head of the Echo Fiscal Commission, recently decried public debate about the tax has degenerated into a, quote, dumpster fire. The reality is an open and honest debate was never what carbon tax advocates wanted. When supporters were on the ascendant, the poor level of debate, including assertions that carbon taxes would be painless despite mountains of contrary evidence, and a naive faith that governments would return all revenues to households, was ignored. Now that support for a carbon tax is waning, it is hypocritical to lament public discussion is abysmal. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cross.